Uh, so this is uh, partially a report on work that's been going on for a long time, and at the end it'll be a preliminary report on a new direction for this project. Uh, it's a long-standing project between myself and Jeff Lagarius, the University of Michigan, uh, and then a, oh, that's weird. Dan Slotum's name should be up there as well. He's my student. He's going to be talking on this stuff a little bit later. Uh, my other student, Artem Bolshakov, uh, played a role in this. Uh, and then uh, Drong Kong, uh, was a mathematician who I met this summer over in Taiwan, who asked a question that led to the, the new direction we're going to be discussing today. Uh, so uh, the outline is, um, I'm going to define a, a couple of objects in symbolic dynamical systems, a path set uh, and a piatic path set fractal. Uh, which is a connection between symbolic dynamics and piatic dynamics. Uh, then I'm going to talk about an application of these ideas to the study of thriatic canon sets, uh, which Ligarius and I began studying uh, to address a, a question in number theory, an Erdos problem. Um, and then the new direction is uh, the question that Durong asked me about uh, concerning self-similarity of intersections and unions and translations of canon sets, things like that. So to begin with, uh, define a path set. So if you let a n be the full one-sided shift space on a finite alphabet, uh, then you can consider a finite edge label directed graph where the edge label labels are taken from that alphabet, and you can distinguish a, a vertex of v. Then the path set, which I'll denote by x g v, is a subset of the full one-sided shift with edge, uh, and it consists of all the sequences of digits from a which correspond to the edge labels of one-sided infinite paths in the graph emanating from the distinguished vertex V. So this is very similar to Sophic shifts, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but it encodes an initial condition uh, in a way that Sophic shifts do not. So path sets are closed subsets of the full one-sided shift uh, when you topologize using the product topology. Uh, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about them today, uh, just to introduce them, uh, the parts of them that I need. Uh, this afternoon, my student Slonim, who I apologize, I don't know why you're not on the list, but uh, my student Slonim is going to be talking about an operation on path sets called interleaving, uh, which has proved very useful for our project on piatic canter sets. Uh, these path sets, uh, I guess I'll talk about motivation uh, in just a minute, but first, I want to talk about the connection with Sophic systems. Uh, a Sophic system is like a path set. Uh, you, you get one sided infinite sequences in A corresponding to the edge labels of the one-sided infinite paths. I'm talking about one-sided Sophic systems here uh, in, a, in a directed label graph, but there's no specified initial version, uh, initial vertex. And because Sophic systems don't have that initial condition, they're shift invariant. Path sets aren't shift invariant in general. So path sets are actually a strict generalization of Sophic systems. If you have a, a Sophic system presented by some graph G, then we have a construction to produce a new graph, G tilde or something, that presents it as a path set where every path in G uh, corresponds to a path in G tilde from the initial vertex. But that presentation could potentially require an exponential blow up in the size of the graph. So the motivation for why we might want to study path sets, it may not be obvious since they're not shift invariant. Uh, but they arise naturally uh, in connection with geometric constructions of fractals, and we'll see some examples of that today. Uh, associated with these constructions, we have address maps, uh, we have given by paths and these finite directed graphs, and they specify labels of points in the limit sets of recursive constructions. So these show up in the graph directed constructions of Malden and Williams, uh, in an iterated function systems, and work of Barnsley. Uh, we'll also see an iterated function systems direction today. Uh, and in describing the limit sets of discrete group actions. Uh, so uh, we developed this concept specifically to study intersections of multiplicative translates of piatic canter sets. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, another application, by the way, which I'm not going to discuss. I don't really know anything about it. Uh, but Ban and Chang, or Ban and Chang, over in uh, Taiwan, have figured out an application of the idea of a path set to the study of multi-layer cellular neural networks. Uh, so there's actually an applied, uh, a more applied angle even than what we've done. Yeah. Sorry, um, which problem of Erdos are you? Mentioning? Oh, I, I'll state it, don't worry. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, just for an example, 
Uh, like I said, path sets aren't in general shift invariant, so even for such a simple example as this. So think about this graph, where this is the fixed initial vertex. Then one, one, zero to the infinity is an element, but one, zero to the infinity is not. The initial condition that's encoded by this is that if you begin, the first one has to be followed by a second one. Feel free to use the pointer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot that I have that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about entropy because I'm going to talk about Hausdorff dimension later, and they correspond. Uh, but the entropy of a path set is just given by the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix of a graph if the graph is you know, sufficiently nice, as long as the graph uh, is right resolving and reachable in the sense that every vertex can be reached by the initial vertex, uh, then that's going to be true. Uh, and so therefore, the entropy is dominated by the strongly connected component uh, with the largest with the largest entropy, so the laser does work. Okay, so in this graph here, if I look at the path set corresponding to this initial vertex, this outer component here is going to generate some positive topological entropy, some, but this inner component here does not, so even if I get rid of this middle part, I still have the same, I have a path set of the same entropy. So, a very light introduction to path sets, so what I really care about today is piatic path set fractals. And so what that is, is it's the image of a path set embedded geometrically inside uh, the piatic integer ZP. So what you do is you take the alphabet A, you take the alphabet A and you map the symbols in A to the piatic digits, and then you can think of a sequence of digits from A as a piatic integer. So uh, if I have a piatic path set fractal, which is a, potentially a fractal living inside the piatic integers, I call the address map, which tells me how to rename the digits, and the graph and that vertex, a presentation for Y. Um, and so a standard presentation is one where the address map is injective so that uh, I'm not sort of eliminating any information by that address map. The graph is right resolving uh, and the graph is reachable. So every piatic path set fractal actually has a standard presentation uh, where I can just take the alphabet to be the symbols from zero to p minus one, and I can take the uh, I can take the address map to just be the identity. So what we should really think of for this talk, that's all we're going to be focusing on, is graphs where the labels are taken from the piatic digits from zero to p minus one, uh, and the address maps are the identities. So we let C Z P, so this symbol down here, just denote the collection of all piatic path set fractals, just for convenience later. So this is set up in a greater generality than we're going to use. So, uh, just some basic properties. Sorry, this click's not working. Uh, this is closed. This set of all piatic path set fractals is closed under piatic addition and multiplication by p integral rational numbers, as well as under the Minkowski sum. Uh, and so, as a special case of that last point, uh, that means that if I have a piatic path set fractal, I can I can translate it however I would like. Uh, so, a result is that. Since this sits inside uh, ZP, I can ask what's its Hausdorff dimension. And the Hausdorff dimension is just going to be log base P of the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix of G, as long as G is a right resolving and reachable presentation. So that means that the, the Hausdorff dimension corresponds to the topological entropy. So for those of you who've worked with SOFIX systems or something like that, this is exactly analogous to, to that work. Uh, really, a lot of the proofs even go through in the same way. Uh, it's just that nobody had ever thought of path sets before because they're not right. They're not uh, shift invariant. So, as far as applications of triadic canter sets, uh, let's talk about the Erdős problem. Uh, Erdős conjecture that for every n greater than or equal to nine, the ternary expansion of two to the n doesn't omit the digit two. Uh, so this is just a, a straightforward, simple state number theory problem. Still very hard, and I'll, I'll give away that we don't we do not solve it. Uh, I want to talk about a triadic generalization of this problem, though. So, sorry, let me go back. Oh, I'm having trouble with the mouse, sorry. OK, so the triadic exceptional set, EZ3, is a certain subset of the triadic integers, defined such that it consists of all those triadic integers where 
when we multiply by 2 to the n, for infinitely many n, that expansion omits the digit 2. So if we weaken Erich's conjecture to say, not that for every n greater than or equal to 9, the ternary expansion of 2 to the n does not omit the digit 2, but just that for only finitely many n does the ternary expansion of 2 to the n omit the digit 2. That's equivalent to the statement that 1 is not in this fractal set, triadic exceptional set. Uh, and so this is a problem that Ligarius studied. There's a paper in 2009 called Ternary Expansions of Powers of 2, uh, in which he states this conjecture that this triadic exceptional set should be small in the sense that it should have Hausdorff dimension 0. So I want to talk about how can we approach the problem of computing the Hausdorff dimension of this exceptional set. We want to approximate by Cantor sets, actually. So we let sigma 3 denote the triadic Cantor set of infinite sequences that omit the digit 2. Uh, then we can, rather than working with EZ3 directly, we can approximate by intersections of multiplicative translates of this triadic Cantor set. So uh, like the Cantor middle third set, except, except omitting, omitting 1, we're omitting 2. OK. Uh, we let EKZ3 be the union of the k-fold intersections of scalings of sigma 3, 2 uh, by 1 over powers of 2. Then what this is saying is EKZ3 is the set of lambda and Z3 <laughs> such that for at least k values, 2 to the k lambda omits the digit 2. So if we take the limit of these EKs, then what we're going to get is, is the triadic exceptional set. So we've developed an algorithm to compute uh, presentations of these sets C1 and 1 through MN as triadic canter set, as uh, triadic path set fractals, and therefore we can compute exactly their Hausdorff dimensions. Uh, so I don't, I don't, we don't need to worry too much about the formula. At the end of the day, point is that computing these dimensions helps us to approximate the dimension of the triadic exceptional set. Um, and so we've actually constructed explicit presentations of these triadic, of these uh, intersections of triadic counter sets as triadic path set fractals and computed their dimensions exactly. So uh, one of the results along these lines, uh, get away from powers of two for just a second and just think about intersecting sigma three, the triadic counter set with 1 over m sigma 3 for any m. That's looking at all the triadic integers that omit the digit 2, and such that when you multiply them by m, they still omit the digit 2. Uh, we've shown that for all m congruent to 1 mod 3, dim h of c1m is less than or equal to log base <coughs> of the golden ratio, which is about 0 0.43018. And actually, there exist distinct integers, an infinite series sequence of distinct integers, such that even, uh, even the infinite intersection of those canter sets has exactly dimension log base 3 of the golden ratio. Um, it follows actually from these computations that the dimension of the triadic exceptional set is less than or equal to log base 3 of the golden ratio. But getting a better upper bound than that is actually pretty tough. Uh, so trying to get it all the way to zero is, is going to be a challenge. We've tried, I mean, I don't have, this isn't what the talk is actually about today, so I don't have time to talk about it. But we've tried three or four different approaches that haven't, ma haven't managed to improve upon this. So, uh, you'll probably, uh, Daniel, is it safe to say you'll talk a little bit about this? Okay. So you'll hear a little bit more about this problem uh, when uh, Daniel Sloanum talks this afternoon. What I want to talk about is I want to give a, a preliminary report. Let me see what time it is. Sorry. We still have like 10 minutes. Oh, I'm good. I'm very good then. I'm, I, I can take my time. Uh, I just want to give a preliminary report on an application of this technique using piatic path set fractals to the study of self-similarity. So I probably don't even need to do this slide, but I will. Uh, an iterated function system on a complete metric, metric space is a finite collection of contraction mappings. And it has a unique non-empty compact fixed set. which We call such a thing a self-similar set. So the question, this isn't exactly the question that Duran Kong asked me, but it's sort of my distillation of it, is is there a way to characterize or identify the self-similarity or non-self-similarity of a piatic path set fractal in terms of properties of a presentation or of a standard presentation of that fractal. So what you can think about if you have no interest in piatic path set fractals, uh, but some interest in canter sets, say, uh, is that if you can answer this question, you can actually quickly determine 
whether intersections and unions of scalings and translations of piatic canter sets are self-similar. Now, if you're not interested in piatic canter sets, but you're interested in real canter sets, corresponding to a given piatic canter set, there's a map that reinterprets those piatic digits as base P digits, and you end up with a real canter set. So even if you just care about real canter sets, the same question uh, applies to you as well. Uh, the reason, so this is why I wanted the board, uh, the reason uh, this question about piatic path set fractals uh, leads to an, potentially an answer to this question here is because if I have, let's say I have ZP, well, I can view ZP as a piatic path set fractal by just taking self loops labeled from zero. So that's a very small picture. Can you guys see that? Do I need to draw it bigger? Okay. Labeled from zero to P minus one uh, at, a, at a single point. It's just one of the simplest possible choices for a piatic path set fractal. But if I let say sigma PD equal the set, set of lambda in ZP such that lambda has only digits from D. So D is some subset of the digits. Uh, that's a piatic canter set. Uh, or I could do the same <coughs> thing where I omit digits from some subset D in a different notation. Uh, all I have to do is erase the appropriate edges. So these canter sets are piatic path set fractals with only one vertex in their standard presentation. I just said uh, on a previous slide that the class of piatic path set fractals is closed under intersections and unions and translations and scalings and anything you would like to do. Uh, and we actually have efficient algorithms to come. And that means that if I have some collection of piatic canter sets like this, I can talk about what do you get when you scale them and intersect them and translate them. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a concrete example or two uh, in just a minute. So that's actually the question that Duran Kong asked me was, do you have a way of figuring out whether intersections and unions of canter sets are self-similar? And so the reason this is a preliminary report is that I have what I believe is an, a sufficient, uh, a, a, a necessary and sufficient condition, a characterization. Uh, I have the sufficiency, uh, and I haven't yet proved the, the necessary. Uh, so the conjecture is this, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain the one direction that I do have. Uh, if I have a piatic canter set Y, uh, and I have a minimal standard presentation of Y, then let L be the collection of all the minimal loops in that presentation. So take every loop that doesn't have a non-trivial subloop. Uh, then Y is a self-similar set if and only if there's some vertex contained in the intersection of all the loops. That is, if I take all of the loops and there's one point that's in every one of them, every single minimal loop. <coughs> and either that is the initial vertex, so that's what I mean by V equals W, or there's a unique minimal path from the initial vertex to that vertex in the intersection uh, in the graph G. So the theorem that I have, uh, and this wasn't hard, so I've only done the easy part, like I said, this is a preliminary report, uh, is that if you do have these conditions on any presentation, any standard presentation of your piatic path set fractal, then it is a self-similar set, and you can actually construct an explicit iterated function system. Uh, so consider, just to set up some notation, I'll just get it all on the board, so if you guys want to read it yourselves, you can. Oh, sorry, it's spinning. Oh. There, okay. So just to set up some notation, let L be the set of all the minimal loops. So each minimal loop looks something like this. It goes, you can view it as being from the vertex that's in all the loops to some other vertex and so on back to W. And so I just you know, have some notation for those edge labels. That's what these are, is the labels. Then I can define FJI from ZP to ZP to just be PX plus that edge label. And the way this is set up, if I let FJ be just the composition of FJ and J all the way to FJ1, so the map coming from this guy and this guy and this guy all the way back to the first one, then I actually get, first of all, this is of the form P to the NJX plus C for some C and Z intersect Z. ZP. What I want to point out, if you're not used to working piatically, is that this is a contraction, because 
taking these larger powers of p is, is shrinking things. So this is an iterated function system for some self-similar set. That much I know. If b equals w, it's not hard to show that that self-similar set x described by this iterated function system is the guy whose presentation you started with. Otherwise, there's some unique minimal path. And using that unique minimal path, you can show that y is of the form p to the n x plus c. So since it's just a scaling and a translation of a self-similar set, it's a self-similar set. In either case, it's a self-similar set. It's not difficult. Okay. All right. So just for the sake of an example, uh, this is really a non-example, uh, I want to say, why would the other direction have to be true? What goes wrong if there's not a unique minimal path from the initial vertex to the, uh, the vertex that's in all the minimal loops? So let y1 just be 9 times sigma 3, 2. So sigma 3, 2 is, just for a reminder, uh, it's the subset inside the three addicts where you're omitting the digit 2. If we scale that up by 9, of course, that's self-similar. Uh, and if we scale it by 9 and add 4, then, of course, that's self-similar. OK? Now, you can find explicit iterated function systems, it's not difficult to do, for y1 and y2. y1, 9 sigma 3, 2, has just 3x and 3x plus 9. And y2, 9 sigma 3, 2 plus 4, has 3x minus 8 and 3x plus 1. So these are both in sigma 3, 2, and therefore their union is. Uh, so y1 union u2, y2 is 9 times this canter set unioned with 9 times that canter set plus 4. The kind of thing that Duran was asking me about. Uh, and a minimal presentation for this is given here. So w is 3 here. The vertex contained in all the minimal loops is 3. So the first condition is satisfied. But there's not a unique path from the initial vertex, which is 0 here, to 3. There are two paths. Let me show you what that ends up looking like. Okay, is I, I, I mapped it over the real so I could draw a nice picture for you. This is the set that we're talking about here. So. Uh, and I, I, I apologize. I don't work. I, I should have given this caveat earlier. I don't work with like iterated function systems, like a lot of you guys do all the time. Uh, this was just my first time seeing it or thinking about it. Really, was this summer because I've been working on a different direction. Uh, so I drew this in paint, but down to the pixel, it's accurate. So <laughs> uh, I don't know what sort of things you guys use to, to, to make your figures. But the point is, what what is happening here is so I can go back. Sorry. The first two digits have to be 0, or the first two digits have to be 1. And that means that if I take my sort of interval, I'm taking the first third of the first third and the second third of the second third. And then ever thereafter, I'm taking the first two thirds of each subinterval. And that is this kind of a symmetry breaking sort of thing to do. This isn't going to be a self similar set. Uh, that's the example that kind of tells me this minimal loop is, seems to be necessary. I haven't proven it yet. It seems tougher than the other direction. But I also haven't thought about it for that long. So it might not be tough. Uh, OK, so just to, to finish with a couple of examples. Uh, for k greater than or equal to 1, let LKP be the intersection of those p addicts that only have digits 0 and 1 with those that only have digits 0 and 1 when you multiply them by 1 over p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. Okay? Uh, then that's a self-similar set. And the way you can show that that's a self-similar set is because it has a presentation that looks like this. It's minimal presentation, although it doesn't even have to be minimal for the, for the sufficient condition. It looks like this. It just has two loops. One loop, self-loop labeled 0 here, and one loop that begins with a 1 and then has a bunch of zeros. And that's because what we're talking about is the guy with presentation 1 to the kp. So if we want to omit any other digits, then after the first one, we, ha we have to follow it with a sufficient number of zeros. So if you check, this satisfies both conditions of the theorem. And therefore, this fractal here is a self-similar set. And, and that means I found a non-trivial intersection for each p that is a self-similar set. I'm focusing on intersections just because that's what mostly that's mostly what I've done, but I'm also interested in looking at some of these other examples. On the other hand, if I look at C143, which is omit the digit 2, and then also omit the digit 2 when you multiply by 43, 
This example came up in my research on three attic canner sets. Uh, and it's, it has a, its minimal presentation is a non-trivial graph. This is a non-trivial set, but it has Hausdorff dimension zero. And therefore, it's not a self-similar set. And that shows you that these guys are not always self-similar. And of course, I had another example to show you that as well. On the other hand, if the conjecture is true, I have more than just a handful of examples that aren't self-similar. So here's a, another infinite family. Look at the guys whose piatic expansion, so I'll go with, I'll just do it for, for three. These are the guys whose expansions looks like two, zero to the k minus one, one in base three. So first you have a two, and then you have a bunch of zeros, and then you have a one. Or in general, first you have a p minus one, and then a bunch of zeros, and then a one. Then if I intersect the piatic canner set where all the digits are zero and one, with those guys that still only have zeros and one when you multiply them by that number, then that's not a self-similar set, if the conjecture is true. So this is just a conjectural application. Uh, and the reason is, I know exactly what the minimal presentations of these guys look like as well, and they don't satisfy the conditions. So if the conjecture is true, well, in general, we have an infinite family of intersections that are self-similar. And if the conjecture is true, we also have an infinite family of intersections of piatic canner sets that aren't self-similar for each p. Um, and I think that there's actually some interesting number theory that lives inside the question, when are these intersections or unions or translations or scalings going to be self-similar? This problem came out of number theory, and uh, it's, it's generated some techniques for understanding uh, some of the number theory that underlies this sort of fractal question. So uh, that was all I wanted to say about this. I wanted to acknowledge uh, the NSF. I, I started this project when I was a graduate student uh, a while ago now. Uh, but I still feel like I should acknowledge them. Um, and the National Center for Theoretical Sciences in Taiwan, which hosted me this summer. And Ligarius was also supported by the NSF. Uh, and so these are references to some of our papers, which were relevant for this. But what I'll leave it on is a references to some of the some of the work of others. That's something that I'm going to be talking with Duran about. Because like I said, I, I don't know those results. I think he does. Yeah, uh, but we want to be talking to okay. I just don't know those results. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the first example you gave of a non-self-similar set, if you zoom in enough, then it starts to look self-similar. That's right. There's just a, there's a symmetry breaking gap between the two pictures because the spacings aren't preserved. But you're right, if you, if, you, if you cut that picture in half, then you have a self-similar set over here and you have a self-similar set over there. But that's what we're doing, right? We're taking the union of two self-similar sets and that union is not self-similar in this case. Any other questions or comments? Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.